You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech, Future Tech Health Podcast. Uh, my guest is Megan Rubel. Uh, she's a graduate student, very soon to be a PhD uh, at the Department of Genetics, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Megan, thanks for coming. And usually this would be like a super busy time. So I'm surprised you made the time to be here and I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, just one, one quick correction. My affiliation is actually with the Departments of Anthropology and Genetics. So I've got a nice dual affiliation there. Excellent. So what is your uh, your master's and your PhD work on? What what are you studying? What are you researching? So they're actually on two different things. Um, I have a master's in public health that I got from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the process of getting my PhD. That's not normal. Uh, most people just go straight through and get their PhD. Um, but I got mine because it feeds directly into uh, my PhD research interests. So my PhD is actually in anthropology. Um, and within that, I study biological anthropology, which is focused on evolution and adaptation um, in human beings um, from a physiologic standpoint. So I ended up, uh, when I came here, working in a lab where I did a lot of human genetics research. So I was working with population geneticist Dr. Sarah Tishkoff, and she had this treasure trove of uh, fecal microbiome samples that had been collected in previous field seasons in Botswana and Tanzania. Those are countries in sub-Saharan Africa before I'd ever even joined the lab. So I was kind of cutting my teeth on some basic projects and, and realized that there was this amazing data set that nobody had looked at yet that just completely oversected with my interests in infectious disease and nutrition and um, both of those within the context of human ev evolution and adaptation. So I just jumped on that, and I've been rolling with it since. Um, and I've expanded that research now to include other populations from um, an additional country in sub-Saharan Africa, Cameroon. So that means you were looking at uh, the microbiome of the fecal samples of people in these areas? Yeah, I'm looking at the um, – it's often referred to as the gut microbiome, and that can be a bit misleading because your, your gut – actually has um, a lot of different sites within it that depending on things like the pH, um, you know, the acidity of, of an environment, um, the oxygen that it may or may not be getting, uh, that can change the composition of the microbes that live there. So often when people say gut microbiome, what they mean is fecal microbiome, and that's from the, the distal colon, because um, that's the easiest sample to get, obviously. Otherwise, we'd have to take biopsies, and that gets really tricky. Okay, so what what's... Uh... What were you? I don't know if you're looking for anything, or you're just seeing what's there. I mean, what have you uh, observed? How yeah. does the microbiome differ amongst these people? So when we first started, we were um, interested in sort of looking at uh, how diet and subsistence correlated with the microbiome. And subsistence is sort of like your lifestyle, so how you get food. So in Botswana and Tanzania, which was that first sample set that I worked on, um, we had comparative subsistence groups from both of those countries. So we had um, an agro-pastoralist group from each country, which means that they have small-scale agriculture, like small gardens that they tend to buy their homes, and some small livestock that they take care of. We had a comparative hunting and gathering group. So those are groups who forage for uh, bush, bush meat and um, plants from the surrounding environment. And then we also had uh, pastoralists, and those are people whose economies and diets center largely around cattle. They have diets that are high in milk, uh, blood, and dairy. So we thought, you know, here's these two different geographies. They're on opposite sides of a continent, east and west. Um, 
let's see if diet trumps all. If, if they're having similarities in their subsistence or diet, and we can correlate those with the microbiome. Um, and that was sort of a h- hypothesis going into it. And then surprisingly, we found that uh, it actually wasn't uh, strongly correlated with diet, or at least as strongly as we thought it was. Um, we actually found more correlates with geography, which was kind of surprising to us. Um, so it ended up being that uh, the types of bacteria that we were seeing within Tanzania and Botswana were very regionally specific. Uh, they had local geographic specificity. And that seemed to be more important than whether or not two different populations were hunter-gatherers. Botswanans looked more like Botswanans overall, and Tanzanians looked more like Tanzanians overall. And both of those countries um, looked very different from U.S. Philadelphians, um, who are omnivores and healthy, but just very different uh, gut bacterial composition. So that was one of the big things that we found in that project. Um, Yeah, well, quick question about that. I guess, you know, the people in those areas, they're, uh, they're... Living off the land and the animals that are there, and the animals eat the local plants and other local animals. So I guess it it makes sense that their microbiome would would be more cemented to the geography, because everything's kind of closely interconnected there more so than me going to Whole Foods and getting stuff that maybe was shipped in from who knows where. Right, right, or you know, like a Philadelphian on the the cheesesteak diet. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it it did make sense. It's just um, when you study a lot of these rural populations, you're always sort of speculating as to what these covariates are going to be because the majority of microbiome studies that have been done to date focus on European and Asian populations. And as a result of that, uh, a lot of our comparative databases that we use to sort of analyze these different microbes are based on, um, you know, non-rural uh, certainly not a lot of African populations. Um, so there's a lot of undescribed diversity there. And uh, we don't exactly know how all that diversity is being shaped in these non-industrialized contexts. So just um, food for thought. So Botswana is a bit more developed compared to Tanzania. They have uh, an infrastructure, an economy that has a lot of money coming in from diamond mines. They have um, a larger, more extended network of medical care. So if anyone was going to be more industrialized, it, it would be the Botswanans. And um, I guess this was more in line with one of our hypotheses was that we would see more similarities between the Botswanans and the U.S. than we would with the Tanzanians and the U.S. And we actually did have a population, uh, an agro-pastoralist group called the Bantu, um, who had individuals that in some of our analyses clustered with the U.S. samples. So in a cluster analysis, you're looking at how similar something is. And the U.S. samples were overlapping completely with a handful of these Bantu Botswanans which was surprising. Uh, And it turned out they had really high levels of a bacteria called Bacteroides. And Bacteroides has been associated with um, industrializing populations. It's been associated with diets that are high in fats and meats. Um, It's also been associated with various ethnic groups. There's no specific single thing that defines why somebody would have Bacteroides. But in general, people from more industrialized contexts tend to have this. Uh, And the fact that we saw it um, when everybody else was high in a, a different fiber diet associated bacteria called Prevotella was interesting. It was like one of these soft indicators that populations that we consider sort of rural, isolated, diverse, um, that they're starting to experience these measures of you know, subsistence change. Um, and it's hard to say exactly what those are, but we are definitely starting to see a transition from some of our, you know, last remaining, for instance, hunting and gathering groups towards a more, um, settled, uh, industrialized environment. Well, what's the consequence of seeing more bacteroides? You've seen differences, but how does that affect the, uh, the person's health or, you know, their physiology, their physiology, or, you know, are we able to correlate it that way at all? So, uh, we didn't see any, um, effects directly between bacteroides, um, and any like health biomarkers. We did note that the Botswanans overall had higher BMI. Um, that was, something we just noticed as a trend in the data. But uh, it's sort of an interesting thing to say, what does bacteroides mean for health? Because, you know, everybody has their own individual gut bacterial, gut microbiota baseline. And um, I think one of the, the things that we struggle with in this field is to define what in fact is a normal healthy microbiome, because it's very context dependent. Um, you can be a healthy person in the U.S. and be bacteroides high, and you can be a healthy person 
in a you know sub-Saharan African country and be Prevotella high, and you're still perfectly healthy. But there's a lot of research right now that's focused on what um, missing bacterial diversity might be doing in terms of our health. So if you compare a hunter-gatherer to um, you or me, a hunter-gatherer is going to be uh, much higher in their bacterial or microbial diversity. And we think that they are uh, in possession of certain taxa that we have lost at some point in our recent evolutionary past as we became farmers and we settled down and we entered and built cities and changed our diets to uh, high fat, highly processed foods. So, you know, there's this idea that um, maybe some of the changes that we've made in our diet might have actually caused our bacteria to change in composition as well. Bacteroides, like I mentioned before, is associated with these diets that are high in fats and sugars. Um, so it's not necessarily going to indicate that you are unhealthy, but I think it is an open question. What kind of diversity is good diversity? Can diversity ever be bad? Um, and I would caution that I think there's a bit of a tendency in our field to maybe uh, romanticize hunter-gatherer groups and think that their microbiomes hold um, secrets to, to global health. And I would really just say that um, you can be a healthy individual without a hunter-gatherer microbiome. I think uh, a lot of the hunter-gatherer populations I've studied um, have amazingly high amounts of diversity, but they also have lots of other infectious diseases that could be modulating that that diversity. So like I said, it's, it's very context specific. I would be careful to say like bacteroides is globally associated with, you know, one physiologically bad thing or Prevotella is one really good thing. You could certainly point out pathogenic bacteria and say that particular one, like Clostridium difficile, we know that in high levels that causes C. diff infections in, in hospitals, nosocomial infections, and it's a major suck of, of public health dollars and a big cause of you know, disease right now. And a lot of research is going towards that. But I think another, you know, category are these commensal microbes where we don't fully understand what they're doing yet or why they only associate with certain populations or what that increasingly, um, you know, lost diversity actually means for our health. Well, what do we know? What have you seen? Uh, you know, what, have you been able to correlate this, uh, these different microbiomes to any common effect that you've seen? You said higher BMI. The Botswana, but what else? So uh, one of the things that we saw that we thought was pretty neat in this data set was we actually found that we could um, look at whether or not a population had sex differences between men and women. And um, we were kind of limited by having to have enough men and women in each group. But we found that uh, Maasai pastoralists and Hadza hunter-gatherers each had differences that we could detect in the composition of their microbiomes. And we think that that actually associates with um, a sexual division of labor that they have. So in Maasai communities within Tanzania and southern Kenya, um, the men will usually go out and take cattle to different watering holes and graze them, while women do more of the domestic duties of milking small livestock, running households, taking care of children, um, selling milk in markets, and these sorts of sexually specific uh, tasks end up, you know, exposing them to different kinds of food resources. Similarly, with uh, Hadza hunter-gatherers who are in Tanzania, uh, the men tend to go out and hunt, and they can be gone for days at a time, while the women will do closer to campsite foraging for food um, and child care. So they uh, have a tendency to snack a lot more while they're doing these things. So you go out and get some berries with the kids, and you're going to eat some of those. So um, we think that, you know, we've we started to really peel apart for some of these populations, some really interesting sex-based differences. Um, some of the other things that have come out are when you map back function to some of these bacteria, um, you can actually start to see some trends that track with that industrialization pattern that I mentioned before. So um, we had a couple of, I guess, really unique things that we saw that came out of the Botswana data set. There is no single like smoking gun kind of um, single uh, functional pathway that we saw. But we did see that the Botswanans, who again are, are comparatively more developed um, African population in this analysis, they actually had more metabolic pathways involved in breaking down environmental pollutants. And that includes bisphenol. Um, you may know bisphenol A as, as the BPA that people have been warning you about in plastics and get water bottles that say BPA free now. Uh, we also saw DDT. And that's interesting because that's an insecticide that uh, you may remember from school, it was responsible for thinning 
um, eagles, eggs, and other bird egg shells. It got banned in the 1970s in the U.S., but Botswana is one of a handful of countries that still continued intermittent but intensive indoor spraying of homes. And that's for vector control of the malaria-carrying mosquitoes there. So there's there's a, an example right there of your microbiome sort of acting like a, a sponge and picking up um, surrounding environmental bacteria that contribute to these these metabolic pathways within the host. Why, why do you think that uh, there are these differences? Well, Tanzania doesn't do as much intensive spraying of VDT. Um, they have before in the past, but it's a lot more intermittent. Uh, and not as intensive, and they're not necessarily doing doing it on the insides of homes. So you can either use DDT in fields, but if you spray it, you know, inside the walls of your bedroom, that's going to have a lot more direct implications for for health and the kinds of bacterial pathways that could be enriched um, because you're exposing yourself to so much more of a chemical. So I think a lot of it is just exposure. Uh, more industrialized groups are exposed to different types of chemicals than people who are living in very rural areas. Okay, interesting. Um, what's the the group? I don't remember the name you gave them, but the group that works with cattle quite a bit. Any particular things that stick out at you there that they had that was different from the other groups? Yeah, so um, we looked at the Maasai, and then in Botswana we looked at the Herero, and uh, we were actually very surprised by the fact that the pastoralists looked largely very similar to the agro pastoralists, the people that have a lot more agriculture. Um, this is this is really surprising if you've ever spent any time with, uh, for instance, the Maasai. So they, I mentioned before, have diets that are enriched in meat, blood, and dairy. So they'll do things like um, while herding cattle in a very dry, uh, sub-Saharan, you know, desertish terrain, uh, savanna terrain. If they get thirsty, one of the common things to do is they will nick a little uh, vein on the neck of the cow, and they'll actually drink blood from the cow. Um, it's considered really? a delicacy. Yeah, they'll actually make blood dishes for ceremonial purposes. Um, and they drink fermented yeah. milk. Um, meat is is not as frequent. It is a bit more of a prized thing because you're the, the term cash cow. These are literally cows that provide them with an income. They are very valuable for the milk that they provide. So a ton of dairy. And we really thought that we would see, you know, an enrichment of bacteria that have the ability to break down dairy in the distal colon. Um, and we really didn't. We, by and large, saw that they looked remarkably similar to the agropastoralists. Um, so again, that was one of those things where we thought diet would trump all, subsistence would be a close second. And instead, we sort of just found, you know, geography matters. There's a lot of diversity, and um, you know, we still have so much to learn. <laughs> why? Why does geography matter so much? Do you think? Well, it would be like saying, um, you know, if you were to go outside and take a snapshot of all the plants that. Where where do you live at? What's your what's your state? I'm in uh, Texas. Texas? Okay. So yeah. I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, if we were to go into our backyards and just take a scoop of soil, I guarantee you that there would be a ton of different biodiversity in that little scoop of soil alone. There's going to be different species of flora and fauna that exist only in that particular ecosystem. And we are sort of uh, interdigitated. We're, we're enmeshed in that environment. So what microbes we get from the outside are also a part of the things that are on our inside. So I think it makes sense that over distances like this in Botswana and Tanzania are not close. Um, you're going to get different kinds of, of food, different kinds of regionally specific microbiota that enter the host. Um, and you also can't rule out, you know, other factors that we're still exploring, such as the role of host genetics. Are there potentially heritable bacterial taxa that are being passed down um, from parents to children that track with certain host genetic variants. So that's another thing that we looked at. Uh, what is the role of overall host genetics? And um, we found that it's essentially correlated with the abundances of bacteria that you have, but that geography is more closely correlated with the presence or absence of bacteria. So maybe you have a similar amount of bacteria in your, of like one particular bacteria in your gut as your genetic relatives do. But in terms of the kinds of things that you have, whether or not you have those compared to another group in a different state or a different country, that's going to be more closely tied with geography. And in a way, I think that that kind of makes sense. I guess I just, you know, by default, imagine people in the United States not being very in touch with their environment or the dirt and people in Africa being much more in touch with the environment and the dirt. Yeah, well, in terms of, um, you know, along that line of thinking, there's 
something that has been discussed and sort of modified over the years called the hygiene hypothesis. Have you heard of this before? I can, I can yeah, go into the details. People that live in, you know, you know, like on farms and are exposed to animals and dirt and all that uh, tend to have less asthma and less other issues. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. So um, this really got started in like the 1970s, a study that was done in Saskatchewan by a group of um, urban white individuals and then they were living um, nearby a group of indigenous inter- individuals, and they found that um, there was higher levels of serum IgE, which is a um, immunoglobulin, uh, it's a type of antibody that's made by the immune system to protect against allergens. Um, the IgE antibodies are normally found in small amounts in the blood, but in high amounts, it's a sign that the body is overreacting to allergens, and this can cause an allergic reaction. So the uh, rural or the urban white individuals actually had higher amounts of IgE than this rural indigenous community. And that sort of kicked things off. And then a little bit later on, um, in another follow-up study, it was reported that uh, children with older siblings were less likely to catch hay fever in these farm settings. And so all of this sort of built towards this hygiene hypothesis. And essentially what it boils down to is that if you have reduced exposure to infections of various sorts in early childhood due to smaller family sizes, improved living standards, um, higher levels of personal hygiene, um, that may produce an increased risk of developing allergic disease later on in life. And since then, it's been extended to include uh, other kinds of immune-mediated diseases like Crohn's, multiple sclerosis, IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And all of these conditions have increased prevalence in these economically developed urban high-income countries, especially within the last few decades. So, um, you know, what's causing that? Um, Variably associated with air pollution, uh, we have in a lot of industrialized contexts, general improvement of living standards and a reduction in pathogens, um, especially during childhood, and that includes helminth infections. So soil transmitted helminths, uh, gastrointestinal worms uh, are very common in uh, non-industrialized countries still, and it's a major public health problem. So in places where worm infection is chronic, um, Older children and adults that have lived with this their whole life, they progressively develop anti-inflammatory tolerance. So they don't have the same kind of severe disease response or uh, disease morbidity in adults as um, they do as infected kids. These kids have naive immune systems when they're first exposed. And that means that an adult host, unlike a kid, can be chronically infected with a low level of worms without showing a severe inflammatory response. And this notion that we have until relatively recently in um, human history, been continuously occupied with parasites, has furthered this extension of the hygiene hypothesis, uh, sometimes known as the old friends hypothesis, that worms are our old friends. And it essentially says that some of the functions of these pathogens may have been beneficial, that we may be, in a way, evolutionarily adapted to worm infection, and that their sudden absence in industrialized societies could be contributing in a way to allergenic and autoimmune illness. And that, that for me, that, that's generated strong interest in the idea that parasites and worms or the products of worms within the human GI tract um, could be the target of, of some new anti-inflammatory treatments. But we don't really know the degree that they modulate the human immune system and the extent that they are interacting with the human gut microbiota, which includes you know more than bacteria, that's viruses and uh, fungi and archaea and that's all still largely unexplored. So that's sort of been where I pivoted with my work after doing my research on diet geography and genetics in Botswana and Tanzania. And that's now the focus of the work I'm doing in Cameroon. Well, I that guess, was a lot you know, to we have a <laughs> I mean, we have, a, we have bacteria that live, you know, that are commensal with us <clears throat> that provide a lot of functions. We have uh, endogenous retroviruses that are integrated into our DNA and are responsible for the placenta and a lot of things. I mean, our mitochondria are supposedly a symbiotic merger of bacteria in our cells. I mean, so maybe it's not so crazy that uh, what we call parasites or worms are integrated into us in a, a beneficial way as well. Yeah, that's sort of my line of thinking. You can certainly, um, you know, look at a lot of these countries that have high levels of parasites, parasitemia, so parasites in the blood or fecal parasites. Um, and the kids there are really sick. Like this isn't, I don't think it's, you could go through and broadly say that they're all our old friends, but to some extent they may be conferring uh, some sort of benefit that we haven't fully explored yet. Um, so diarrheal illnesses, which are caused by a myriad assortment of different factors, are the second biggest killer of children 
um, after pneumonia. So you obviously don't want to have really, really sick kids, but at the same time, um, you know, when you wipe out all of these parasites, uh, the trade-off could be more atopic or allergic disease. Um, certainly when I was doing field work in Cameroon, I didn't see too many kids that were complaining about allergies. It, it never came up. Not once. <laughs> but we did have a lot of kids think- that had had okay. warm infections. That one. Yeah. Has there been an instance where we've seen that uh, someone has a, you know, again, the traditional thinking, or at least the layman's thinking on parasites is parasite steals from you, eats your nutrients, and leaves you with nothing. But perhaps the parasite acts as part of digestion. Maybe it eats certain things that that you take in, and its metabolites or its waste becomes food for you. Maybe it produces beneficial molecules and, you know, modifies some of the things we eat to make them... uh, more amenable to our normal digestion or I don't know. Yeah. So um, I don't think we fully explored all of this yet. I mean, there's a whole entire field of parasitology that's working very intensively on eradicating and understanding parasites. Um, I think that you can think of parasites sort of like you do of microbes. They, they could be another calibrating force for your immune system. Uh, we know very little of the role of gastrointestinal parasites for this. Um, we know that they secrete carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Uh, into their surrounding environment. And we oh, have some examples. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, like that's how they are essentially chemically communicating with their surrounding environment. The extent that they communicate with microbes and in turn how parasites could either directly modulate the immune system or could interact through the resident microbiota to change immune system function within a host is still pretty unexplored for a lot of um, human parasites. Most of the work that we have and the things that we know come from animal models. So we know that uh, there's filarial nematodes. Those are kind of parasite of the blood. Um, they make a glycoprotein that actually causes a certain immune response, a TH2 immune response, um, to increase over other pro-inflammatory immune responses, TH1, TH17. And um, lots of these extracellular products made by, by these parasites can protect, or at least in this case, can protect against um, allergens in, in mouse studies, in murine studies. And they can reduce allergen-induced inflammation. So there's like a trade-off between your Th2 and Th1 immune responses. Um, Th2 are canonically associated with infection with um, helminths, worms, and Th1 are more associated with bacterial and viral infections. And they almost have uh, a bounce. So you can see as one increases, the other decreases. So you can imagine using stimuli from one of those to sort of challenge the other. So TH1 to challenge TH2, TH2 to challenge TH1. Um, and atopic illness, allergic illness, falls in that that TH1 group. So, uh, you know, you have a lot of TH2 associated parasites causing TH2 immune responses. The thinking is maybe that's why we see less atopic disease because they tamp down the TH1 and it's that swing back and forth. And if you have a lot of I don't know if we've done it the other way around. If somebody who's incredibly allergic to something is given a parasite, if they are more resistant, I don't. I don't actually know about that. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's a mistake to classify them as parasites. They could be, uh, again, mutualistically beneficial to people. And they, you know, but just like you're fermenting something and that bacteria takes precedence and creates an environment unfriendly to other bacteria, maybe these parasites um, create an environment that is not friendly to other parasites that would be worse. And then their their tax is that they they feed off of us a little bit, but they benefit us. So yeah, I think that's the big thing is um, it's sort of that sliding scale, right? How much how many disease symptoms can you have before this becomes something that has a potential benefit to something that could maybe hurt you? Um, there's been some studies that have been done on uh, looking at the role that uh, giving you know, parasites to people might actually have some sort of beneficial effect. There's been clinical studies that have been done in the past sort of intermittently and without really big splashy results. So they've been kind of contradictory. Some have shown that um, being given, I think it was trichuris suis, uh, in low levels could actually alleviate some inflammatory disease symptoms for things like IBD and Crohn's. Other studies, big case control cohort studies, have shown that there is no association. So we're still very much in the the infancy phase of sort of looking at how parasites could, you know, help with health, alleviate disease, and what exactly their role is within the microbiome. We also haven't fully clarified what kinds of endogenous microbes parasites have themselves. So how much is a 
a random worm in your stomach contributing to the resident microbiota of your gut? It's an open question. Um, I think that there's, you know, a mobilizing research community who's just starting to investigate that. And it's a, a fascinating area. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Is there a way to figure out the communication that a parasite has with our microbiome, with our immune system? Is there communication, uh, you know, uh, is the parasite trading, again, with us for resources and nutrients, and then maybe it has a different set of trades with the microbiome surrounding it? It's just kind of crazy. I don't even know how you'd elucidate that. <laughs> it's very elaborate because all of a sudden you've gone from um... – you know, thinking about one or two things interacting to a whole consortium and ecology of microbes that could be interacting with parasites and then all these different immune factors at the same time. Um, I think, you know, a couple things. One, when you're first sort of going about asking these questions in a scientific research setting, you typically want a controlled environment. You want as few variables as you can put towards these really complex problems as you can when you first start. So you can start eliminating things that you know, you might think might not be important or you know, identifying causal mechanisms or at least associated mechanisms. Um, and then you add things in. So a lot of times you'll hear about germ-free mouse studies um, where they take, you know, a, a mouse that has no resident microbiota and they'll treat it with a parasite and watch what immune things parameters change. Or they'll have a very specific fixed microbial community within uh, a mouse. And then they'll give it one particular kind of parasite and look at how that changes the composition of the, the microbes and the associated immune responses. Um, and with humans, it's it's really controversial and difficult, although we have done some clinical studies, to give people parasites and then see how they do. And there's so many environmental variables that it's hard to control. People don't tend to like being stuck in hospitals for long periods of time and these you know longitudinal controlled settings. So um, if you're wandering around, it's hard for a scientist to control the kinds of foods that you're eating or what you're being exposed to in the environment. So it's it becomes so complicated when you move up into these, um, you know, non-scientific research organisms like people sometimes are. These, um, you know, mice are typically used, rats are typically used, and you want to try to limit the variables. So I think one of the reasons this is such a difficult thing to ask is because there is so much happening in the nexus of the microbiome between the environmental things that you're introducing into the GI system, the parasite, the host immune function, the microbial crosstalk that could be happening between parasite and host immune function. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to do in Cameroon uh, is sort of tease a little bit of this out. So we actually um, went around in a field season in 2015. So I got to, to go out as part of that field work with uh, Dr. Sarah Tishkoff's lab. And um, we sampled from, took samples from different populations living all over Cameroon. Again, we um, had hunter-gatherer groups from the south, the Baca and Bajieli. We had Fulani pastoralists up in the northwest. And then we had Bantu agro-pastoralists from all over. And um, they have a variety of different infectious diseases depending on what region you're in. And we we're sort of starting to tease out what some of these correlations between the microbiome and parasites um, could be, which is very exciting. Any, any correlations you found so far? I mean, um, probably, yes, like early, yeah, but. I haven't I haven't published it yet. So uh, I can tell you that um, we are finding that instead of looking at individual parasites, it does seem to be a combination of different bugs together that additively seem to be having an effect on the microbiome. So we looked at blood parasites. Uh, we looked at fecal parasites. Um, and we were able to do a lot of different predictive modeling to see what kinds of microbiota were in a in somebody's gut were most predictive of having uh, a certain parasite profile and um you know coming soon knock on wood in the next few months uh hopefully we'll have some really cool finalized results to show you about uh some associations that we found with with parasites and the microbiome <laughs> have you looked at uh, maybe the inheritance of parasites you know a pregnant woman in uh cameroon that has X number of blood parasites and, you know, fecal parasites, et cetera, when she gives birth, does the baby have that? Yeah. So um, getting like malaria when you're pregnant is extremely dangerous for both mother and baby. But we did not include anybody in our study who we knew to be pregnant. So we don't have that kind of data. Um, we do have families. So we do have related individuals. But I was not looking at family units within my research. I was looking more at uh, people within specific sampling sites. 
So we had, um, I believe, nine different sampling sites. And I was more interested in populations that overlapped within a single sampling site. So if you are a hunter-gatherer and you have a neighboring Bantu group, are they do they share a lot of the same parasites? Do they show similar trends in the kinds of bacterial taxa that they have or microbial taxa um, based on the place that they live? Could they be sharing overlapping, you know, resources, food, or is it something specific to, you know, one of those groups? Is it just the hunter-gatherers or is it just the agropastoralists? Um, hmm. And another important thing is, unlike the Botswana and Tanzania study, we also expanded our data collection here. So we're now doing what's called shotgun sequencing. There's um, a couple different ways that you can interrogate the microbiome. One is through doing something called amplicon analysis. And you typically go after one organism and you look at a taxonomically informative section of their genome. And then you sequence that. So for bacteria, um, one of the favorites is to use the 16S rRNA gene. And this is an area that has a high degree of conservation in different segments of the genome, and it's flaked by these um, variable regions. So what you do is you essentially um, design primers, which are little strings of, of nucleotides, um, and you put those on the conserved pieces, and then they pull up all the variable stuff. And the variable stuff in between will actually tell you what that bacteria is. So that's one way to do it. Now, it's cheap, um, comparatively cheap. It is easy to do on a large scale, um, but it's only telling you about one segment of one gene across bacteria. And depending on what segment you target in this gene, you may pick up some bacteria that you otherwise might not if you switch to a different segment of the, the 16S gene. So shotgun sequencing is cool because shotgun sequencing says, let's chop up all of the DNA from all of the organisms in there. We're going to add a little molecular bar tag, barcode onto all of those organisms, put them in a sequencer, and try to reconstruct some genomes or you know, segments of genomes and scaffolds, see what we get, and then we'll describe more of the microbiome. Um, so what happens is you end up sequencing out a whole bunch of bacteria. You get some host reads from the actual human. Um, those get removed, filtered out, and then the remaining stuff is uh, fungi, archaea, and sometimes you get some viruses and phage. Um, for Cameroonians, I could also get some of the uh, protists, too. So I could get things like um, entamoeba, which is an amoeba. I could pull out uh, giardia. We could get some of the helminths that we'd found before. So those would be things like Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant roundworm. Um, Strongyloides stercoralis, Necator americanus, just all different kinds of interesting hookworms. Uh, and you can see that in the shotgun data. It's not as high as what you would expect for, um, you know, individuals that you know were, were positive, but you wouldn't, you know, expect it to be given what percentage of the total microbiome these parasites are. They're a small fraction of the DNA that goes into these sequencers. The vast majority, again, is bacterial. So between those two techniques, um, shotgun's more expensive, it's more labor intensive, um, it takes a lot of computational time to put all of the genomes together, uh, but they give you a really informed look at the microbiome. What about, um, you know, when someone doesn't have a parasite versus when they get it, looking at how their gene expression changes, their epigenetics? I know you yeah. can't study everything, but you can't figure <laughs> yeah, out the communication between all these things. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's a, that's a place to look for a significant change. It totally is. We need more longitudinal studies in the microbiome field. I think one of the limitations to date has been that a lot of the work that's been done so far is associative. You know, we see this thing, it's associated with this, but we're kind of missing a bit of the, the functional testing, you know, bringing stuff back to the lab, actually seeing what kinds of products it makes, what kinds of protein something expresses. Um, and one of those things that you said, looking at gene expression, would be fascinating to do. Um, if I could sample, say, in, in Cameroon or another country, for people that I know tend to have recurring infections with a parasite of interest, could I go during the dry season, um, ask mm -hmm. hunter-gatherers to participate, see what their microbiota looks like at an uninfected baseline? And then the wet season comes around, and inevitably people will get... Um, in tropical damp environments, it's really hard to, to not contract parasites in some of these areas. Um, and Cameroon does have a public health system. They have deworming campaigns. It's more that these populations are rural, 
very hard to get to, sometimes hours away. So you could possibly stay with a group for a long period of time and just get this really great snapshot of how their microbiome changes in response to different sorts of pathogens like gastroenteric parasites. That would be a great yeah. future research project for, for all of you listeners out there. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. So, um, you know, it's time to wrap up. What what's the um, what are some of your goals for the next year or so, or the next couple of years? What what do you want to elucidate? Um, I am sort of myopically looking towards graduation right now, <laughs> full steam ahead. Makes sense. Um, I would really love to do some virome work with some of the samples that we have in hand. You know, I mentioned earlier that the the virome, all the viruses, it's a small portion of the the gut microbiome. Um, but there's actual strategies you can do in the lab to enrich on virus-like particles. And when you do that, you can actually put those through the sequencer and get a whole bunch more information. Um, viruses are the most abundant organism on Earth. They they far outstrip bacteria. We know even less about viruses and, and phage than we know about bacteria. And again, this is an ecosystem. So phage are actually these small viruses that predate bacteria. So if you want to talk about how to control bacterial illnesses, if you're thinking about what are we going to do in the face of severe antibiotic resistance to some of our best drugs, phage therapy is something that's been floated for a long time and is sort of coming back up to the forefront again. So I think that's going to be a really interesting line of research to go into. Um, like I mentioned before, I'd love to know what's inside of these parasites. What are what are they contributing to the gut microbiome? And are the things that they're contributing persisting in the host gut? Do they stay around as residents or do they leave when the parasite leaves? You know, we eat things that sort of that the bacteria and viruses of our food kind of wave at our resident bacteria and they get flushed out the other end of our bodies. They don't stay for, you know, very long. So what is the um what's going on in there? What are what are parasite microbiomes contributing to human microbiomes? That would be fascinating as well. Um as an anthropologist, a surprising amount of my work has become very computationally oriented. So I think uh a really interesting area is looking at the tools, the computational and analytic tools that are being designed to analyze the microbiome uh, and the role of things like predictive modeling and AI and, and sort of making inferences about microbiome composition and what we could expect for health. It's a fascinating area right now. Uh, we're just generating these massive data sets from it. And I'm just, it's an exciting field to be in. It's sort of like the Wild West of science. Uh, we're still, you know, figuring out what's going on. Hey. <laughs> we're very good. So Megan, what's what's the best way um for people to uh to get in touch or at least to see you know where your work's being published and everything? Um so we have our Tanzania and Botswana paper out in genome biology. Um I have let's see, uh anybody with questions could email me at ruble at upen.edu. Um and then Hopefully, our Cameroon data is going to be coming out in the next couple of months. So, you know, just keep those search engines going. And I can also be searched on Dr. Sarah Tishkoff's lab website and Dr. Rick Bushman, who's been co-mentoring me in all things microbiome and microbiology. So multiple ways to reach out. Look at what those two labs are doing. Um, we've got some really cool projects. And if anybody wants to come do science with us, you know, send us a note. Very good. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was really fun to talk with you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now and the companies that are using these technologies for the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, Please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.